Let's uh, just posture our hearts before the Lord in prayer and ask for his leading. Lord, we thank you that in your light we see light. We thank you that you have delivered us from the domain of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. We thank you that we are now sons of that coming day. We are sons of, of light. So Lord, we put on the armor of light this morning and we ask you for your light to break in. We ask you for your face to shine upon us. That your glory would fill us again. That your glory would fill this room. We long for your presence. We long for your nearness. We long for encounter, Lord. We long to be molded and shaped and changed into your image. We long just to be with you, our bridegroom. We long to experience you, our King. We tremble before you, our judge. We thank you that in the mercy of your Son, you have saved us from divine wrath. Lord, we ask you that the message of the cross would be held out to those who are still under that wrath. That because of their sins, they would be judged if you returned right now and brought the coming age. God, we ask that eyes would be open to the glory and the mercy of the cross of Jesus Christ this morning all throughout Colorado, all throughout the Front Range, all throughout the Western Slope. Lord, we ask that Jesus would be glorified and that the cross would be seen through the lens of the Holy Spirit as wisdom run into the mercy of the cross, run into the mercy of the name of God, run into him as a refuge. And Lord, we thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life. We just glorify you this morning as the way. We glorify you this morning as truth. We glorify you this morning as life. We glorify you this morning, King Jesus, eternal, immortal, seated at the right hand of God, coming on the clouds of heaven. We glorify King Jesus. We glorify the Father this morning from whom it all came, to whom it's all returning for his glory, for his majesty, for his praise, that our Father would be all in all, we thank you, Father. We glorify you. We bless your name this morning. We bless your name, Father. We glorify you, Holy Spirit. We thank you that you are the deposit of the resurrection, the down payment of our inheritance, the, the power of the age to come that will transform this world that will make all things new. We glorify you, Holy Spirit. We say, do that in our hearts today. Do that in our hearts today. Make us new today. Glory, we ask you for the glory of the age to come, just to, that we would encounter that and we would be changed from glory to glory into the same image. Thank you, Lord. Just begin to thank the Lord. Just put thanksgiving on your lips for whatever puts in your heart. Thank you, God. Worthy Lamb, thank you for your blood. Thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for reconciling the earth. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for filling us. Spirit, thank you for not leaving us as orphans. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you, all authority 
Jesus, we'll give it to you. Thank you for future glory. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you. We love you, Jesus. and generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Sing that again. A thousand generations Falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. And the angels cry, Holy, all creation cries, Holy.
I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone belong to worship. You alone, you're worthy of my praise. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone, I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. You were praise you're worthy of our praise worthy 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 just begin to lift your own song to the Lord your own prayer to God worthy worthy great king of all the earth. O king of the ages, who will not fear you? Who will not glorify your name? For your judgments are righteous and they are true. O 
King of the ages, who will not fear you? And who will not glorify your name? For true and righteous are your judgments. Bless you. Bless you, Jesus.
the shame of the cross to the lamb who was slain as atonement for us to the son who overcame all the power of death we praise for the stripes for the wounds for the beating you bore for the tears for the blood that was willingly poured for the merciful, wonderful majesty of your love. To the one who endured all the shame of the cross, to the Lamb who was slain as atonement for us, to the Son who overcame all the powers of death, we pray. For his stripes, for his wounds, for the beating you bore, for the tears, for the blood that was willingly poured, for the merciful, wonderful majesty of your love. To the one who endured all the shame of the cross, to the Lamb who was slain as a toy.
down. We worship, we all cry out. You are worthy, God. You are worthy, God. Oh. You are worthy, God. You are worthy. Jesus, I am yours, and forever I want nothing more than to be with you. Jesus, I am yours, and forever. I want nothing more than to be with you. And Jesus, I am yours and forever. I want nothing more than to be with you. Jesus, I am yours, and forever I want nothing more than to be eternal life to know you oh to be with you oh, this is eternal life to love you oh to be with you oh, this is eternal life to worship oh to be Oh! 
in this confession, Jesus. We love you, Lord, with all that we are, with all that we have. Jesus. We just pause for just a moment here. Just a Selah moment to just listen to him. encourage you. There's no distractions right now. Every eye on him. Every eye on Jesus. The Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil advances against me to devour me, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. These are the words of David. I believe before he even stepped in as the king. And the Lord was preparing his heart for those that would come against him, for the armies that would besiege them, for those that would, that would try to attack, for the wars that would, would break out. And David responds. I will not fear. My confidence will be in you, Lord. And then he says one thing I ask of the Lord. He could have asked the Lord 
anything. But he starts in the position of trust and of fearing the Lord. And he says, and Lord, this is what I ask of you. In the place as king, in the place as ruling over a nation, he said, this is what I seek. Lord, I want to dwell in your house all the days of my life. I want to look upon you. I want to gaze upon your beauty. It's the one thing that I ask. Lord, I ask right now for that longing in our heart. Lord, there's nothing more that we need. We don't need the things of this world. They'll do nothing for us. We don't need a better job or more money or more of this or more of that or more success or more protection or more of these things. One thing. May we ask of you for one thing. Increase the longing of our heart for you. That our desire would be to look at you face to face. To be in your presence. May that be the one thing. Teach us your ways, Lord. May we not be those that try to go our own way and ask you to bless it. We want to go your way. And if our eyes aren't on you, we're not going to see the way to go. If there's other longings in our heart, if there's a lack of purity in our heart, we're not going to see you rightly. For those that are pure in heart, they will see God. Lord, I pray for clean hands and pure hearts. I pray for that fire to burn off all the things that are not of you. I pray for hearts that are longing for you, Lord. Let it start with us right here. David could have asked for anything. And I believe the Lord would have given it to him. He, had a, he was a man after God's own heart. And he said, Lord, I don't need anything else. I don't need success. I don't need anything. I just need your presence. I just need to be able to see your face. I just need to be able to gaze upon you and upon your beauty. From that place, he could rule a nation. From that place, he had wisdom, favor, because the Lord was with him. It says, for in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle. He goes on to say this in verse 8. This is Psalm 27. He says, My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Lord, our heart says, seek your face. Your face, Lord, we will seek. Matthew pens this in, in Matthew 6, and I believe it's just a Kind of another way to write this, he says, seek first 
It's the words of Jesus, but Matthew wrote it through the Holy Spirit. Jesus said these words, Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. Seek my face. Make that the one thing above everything. Lord, I pray that you remove all the other longings, all the other desires, all the things that make us anxious. I heard somebody say this the other day, just when our eyes are on Jesus, the adoration of Jesus, there can be no anxiousness, there can be no fear. But when fear comes in, it is a sign that we've taken our adoration, we've taken our focus off of Jesus. For when you're in the presence of the Lord, fear has no place. Anxiousness has no place. Worry has no place. Lord, we desire to fear you above all else, not the things of this world. You're the God of the universe. Remind us who we are. Remind us that we have been made temples of the Holy Spirit. The very Spirit of God rests on the inside of us that our inheritance, we are co-inheritors. We're, we're not of this world. Though we're in it, we are not of it. We're of another kingdom. So shift our mindset. Get our thoughts and our eyes and our, our attention off of the things that matter not so that we can accomplish what you call for us to accomplish on this earth. For the things we do will not come from a place of fear, but it will come from a place of love. And love is a place of surrender to him, complete surrender. Love is a place where our lives no longer matter on this earth because our eyes are so fixed on Jesus, on his ways, on the kingdom. We have no fear of this world. We have no fear of loss. We have no joy in gain of the things of this world because our joy is in the Lord and that's where our strength comes from. I want to put the words of that vow up. If you can put those words, this is my promise, my solemn vow, my prayer, my solemn vow. There we go. I want to, I'd like to speak this together and then maybe sing it again, but just I felt like it was important that we actually declare this as words Sometimes you sing it and it's almost like it can kind of not, you don't process what you're saying. And I, I, this is so powerful, these words. But I want it to come from our heart. Don't just say the words. But that we make a vow to the Lord as we've been singing. We declare this over our lives right now. that there's a shift coming to the church and it is into oneness. It's a shift back to the bridegroom. It's all eyes on him. And when our eyes are on him, our eyes are actually on the body of Christ. And there's such a love for the body that we begin to have that 
that takes us out of a place of the ability to be offended by what maybe someone else in the church says, by what they've done to us, but that the love of Christ that's in us, that we're so rooted in that love, we're so grounded in that love that it actually surpasses our understanding. It takes us beyond the ability to be offended, to have anger or frustration or resentment or bitterness or unforgiveness towards someone because we're so grounded in the love of Jesus that is so long, so wide, so high, so deep. It becomes our strength. It becomes the very thing that knits the body of Christ together. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. Let's just, let's declare these words together. And just speak it out loud. This is my prayer. It's my solemn vow with all that I am and with all that I have, I will love you. I will love you. With all of my heart, my soul, and my mind, I pour out an offering of worship and cry, I will love you. I will love you. Love is not a feeling. Love is an action. Jesus says these words. He goes, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. Lord, I thank you that your church was never meant to be passive. But as we seek first your kingdom, I thank you for the activeness of your church. I thank you that you are preparing a people for action, for holiness, for your love. And that the very acts of love, the very things that we do that come from you that are the will of God and only the will of God, that act of love is the very thing that will reveal the heart of the Father to the world around us. That we will be known by our love. That love. Not a love that the world knows, but an agape love that goes beyond our strength, beyond our ability, that is rooted and grounded in you, Jesus. True love the only love revealed to the world so that we may know how much the Father loves us. Let's just sing this song one more time. Let's declare this as a people, as a church. This is my prayer. It's my song about with all that I am. With all that I have, I will love you. I will love you. With all of my heart, my soul, and my mind, I pour out an offering of worship and cry, I will love you. I will love you. This is my prayer, it's my solemn vow With all that I am, with all that I have I will love you I will love you With all of my heart, my soul and my mind I pour out an offering of worship I will love you. I will love you.
my strength I will love you with all of my heart I will love you with all of my mind and my strength I will love you with all of my heart I will love you with all of my mind and my strength I will love you with all of my heart Oh, Jesus, I am your So, Lord, we make that our prayer. We make that a vow today. Not just a fun song that we sing and and go home and go about our day. But today, we make this vow. Today, we say yes to you, Jesus. Today, we say we long for you, Jesus. Today, we say let our hearts be changed, Jesus. May we not be the same as we behold you. You transform us into your likeness. Make us more like you. As we become lovers of you, we will overflow to become lovers of people, lovers of those around us. For only from you can we have that love. 
Only out of the abiding can we receive that love, that strength to love as you first loved us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Tell you what, would you guys just do this before you sit down? I know many of you are sitting down. <laughs> but would you just would you just love someone around you? Maybe just introduce yourself if you don't know them. Give somebody a hug. Tell them, tell them you love them. Amen. We're going to just quickly take the uh, tithes and offerings and give some quick updates on things. And Andrew has a message this morning that I think is going to really bless you. Uh, yeah. So I'll tell you what, let's, let's do the offering and then as, the, as that's being passed, then I will just quickly share a few things. So, Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity we have just to, to come before you with our tithes and our offerings. Uh, Lord, we want to bless you in every way, in every aspect of our lives. And so we thank you that we get to give. We get to give into the kingdom where we lay up treasures where moth and rust cannot destroy. So, Lord, we ask you for just a blessing right now over your people, Lord, that we, we would be a generous people in all that we do and all that we have. Lord, that you call us to great things, far beyond just even like just the tithes and the things, but, Lord, you call us to be kings and priests, to rule and to reign. I believe that's in finances as well. And so, Lord, I, I thank you that we can in the same way that we die to the other things, Lord, we die to this, this desire, this, think, this thought where we need finances. Lord, we steward well what we have, but it's, it's yours. And so we thank you for the opportunity we have to give. We bless your name this morning. I just pray a blessing over every person, everyone in this place. I know there are many online for multiple reasons with the snow and just some sickness that's going around and things. And, and even in that, I just want to pause here. I just, Lord, I just pray for your healing balm, for your protection. I pray for healing for every person, for everyone who's, who's maybe at home right now watching online. I just feel like just put your hand on wherever it is, if it's this, like, cough thing that's going around, just put your hand on your chest. And, Lord, I just thank you right now that you are our healer. Lord, we look to you as the healer, and I just speak healing right now in the name of Jesus over every person. Lord, we declare it in the name of Jesus, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. And as we are ambassadors of the kingdom, as we are ambassadors of Christ, Lord, we get to carry out your will, your plans, your purposes. And so we know that your plans and your purposes are for healing for your people. So, Lord, I thank you that even in that, as we look to you, as we cry out to you, Jesus, I thank you that you're touching people all across this place. You're touching people in the homes right now. And I thank you for a release of your healing power to strengthen, strengthen immune systems right now in Jesus' name. I pray your blessing over every person here and online in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, there's Andrew. <laughs> so where'd you go? Um, just a couple things. We've got baptisms coming up. Oh, and Club 58 is released. Fifth through eighth graders are released. 
to go with Olivia, it looks like. Olivia, there she is. Thank you. Um, but we have baptisms coming up on the 18th next week, so if you'd like to be baptized, we already have quite a few. Uh, so that's going to be just email family at therock.org and uh, let us know. And if you forget, just come. We have clothes. You'll be good. Uh, yeah, We're, baptisms are always fun. We're going to do it during worship. Um, two other things. Oh, I don't know if we have this slide up or not, but we have a base camp summer camp coming up here in July. And so we're making, oh, there it is, yes. So it's five days, four nights. It's a little more intense than our normal, uh, uh, intense. It actually won't be intense, but it will be in, a cab, in cabins. So it's a little more in cabins. Um, there we go. <laughs> that was a bad joke. <laughs> uh, but it's actually, it's in Nebraska. It's going to be at a lake. Uh, there's going to be a lot of fun things. But the main thing is Jesus, and it's going to be really just pressing into him. Uh, Four nights, five days, six to 12th graders. And, uh, and if you don't have kids, we would love for you to sponsor a child as well. There's so many students that, that do want to go and maybe don't have the opportunity. Uh, and especially because this one's a little more expensive. And so uh, even if you can give a partial scholarship or something, that would be awesome. So there it is. It's basecampsm.com. Um, and then last thing I just want to mention is is the upcoming Converge 2024 conference that's coming up with John Bevere, and, but also with many leaders, regional pastors and leaders that are going to speak into things. And I, I want to encourage you. I, I was so encouraged yesterday as I was uh, just uh, talking with some of the regional pastors. Um, uh, one of our pastors down in, Color, or in, uh, in Pagosa Springs uh, Justin Fry was down there and just talking to him about the things that the Lord is stirring. He's talking to another pastor up in, in Estes Park and, and just in, in a, another pastor in, in, the, in the Denver area um, who's, who's over actually a couple hundred African-American churches and, and just has this huge heart for prayer and for the Lord and for the unity of the church. And uh, talking to the, the, the pastor of, of House Church, which was Upper Room, uh, and just, just getting stirred by what the Lord is doing in this region. And so I want to encourage you. I feel like, I mean, John Bevere is going to be amazing in the things that he has to release over the church. And I believe he's going to be talking into the fear of the Lord and some things that the church needs to press into. But then after that, there's going to be so many pastors from all over the, the state of Colorado and leaders that are going to be sharing the heart of what God is doing and what we need to, what we need to see in this time and prepare ourselves for. So I just feel like, like, don't miss this. This is something powerful for what God wants to do. And prices, the ticket prices, we, sp we purposely kept them very low. Uh, and if you can't afford to go, never let money be an object or, or, or some reason why you can't go. Just email us at family at the rock and we'll work with you. Uh, so with that, Andrew, come on up. Would you guys just reach your hands out to Andrew? Thank you. Pastor Andrew here. So Lord, we just thank you for the word that Andrew has that he's going to release. Uh, he doesn't exactly know how this is going to flow, but that's perfect because the Holy Spirit does. Lord, we just ask right now, even we, we ask for the words to come forth, but that doesn't quite do it. Lord, I ask that as the words are released, that our hearts would be open, tender, that you would cut deep to the heart. Lord, it says that your word is sharper than a two-edged sword. So as these words, as your word is released, Lord, I pray that it actually changes us, that it cuts us that it forms us and shapes us to become more like you. So, Lord, I just thank you for this time. We bless Pastor Ender as he gives the word. In. And everyone said, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, thank you, Rock Church, for letting me get to share my heart with you this morning. Uh, last week, uh, we had a fun, we call it our, our family Sunday, because we got to break up into, into little groups and connect as the help get the family of God reconnected to each other and then also, you know, in smaller groups and before that we have the breakfast. But 
during that time, we were looking at Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, both passages talking about the body of, of Christ, the body of believers, and the different members, and the different parts, and the different giftings, and the different ministries, and all of it working together to create one thing that functions well, and with life, and vitality. Uh, and, and moving from that, as we discussed that, on Wednesday, Pastor Mike sent out an email, and he touched on, on Ephesians 4, about the love that becomes the ligaments that binds those different parts together. So the hand has a, has a tendency to think, well, I don't need the eye. It doesn't do nearly as much as the hand does. And the eye might say, well, I don't need the hand because I can see and the hand would do nothing without me. And, and, and there tends to be this, this, uh, this pull towards either competition or neglect that either we compete for, well, who's better and my way is different than your different, so I must be better or worse, or um, we, we think that we don't need each other. Well, they do it differently, so we don't need them because they're not doing it our way. And we see that happen within four walls of the church and within other churches. But when we operate with love, with the love of God, it brings those things together. Those parts that might be different, those giftings that may be different, um, those parts of the bodies that seem so unlike one another, all of a sudden can operate in unity. And it's great that we get to talk about this leading up to the conference because, as Pastor Mike was just mentioning, it's so many diverse leaders uh, from different backgrounds and from different parts of the body coming together to, to give glory to the head, to give glory to Jesus, to say that all of us are different and, it, and we can be aligned with Jesus without having to be uniform, that we can be aligned and supporting each other without having to be identical without all having to be afoot. Um, we can play our unique roles and we can do that. But the only way that happens is, is with love. So I wanna open this morning, I wanna look at Colossians chapter three. And you're welcome to follow along. We're, we're gonna put a lot of these up on the screens. Um, but I have a, a ton of text that I wanna, wanna look at. I wanna lay a foundation for why love is important and what love should be and how we should think about love. And then, um, I might hit you with a little bit of a curveball uh, because we're going we're gonna to shift into an area where I think in our self-examination we might fall short, but when we invite God to examine our hearts, he's kind enough to expose areas where, where we may have overlooked or given ourselves the benefit of the doubt or maybe too much credit, and, and he'll, in his kindness and in his love, he'll say, hey, this is really what I want you to work on. So while parts of this might seem elementary, and you might say, yeah, love, we get it, we've been singing about it all morning, <laughs> um, I, I think there's going to be something really great for each of us. Um, so let's start in Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. It says, above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony. Or translated another way, it says, in addition to all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And so when you're trying to hold two things together, uh, having the right bonding agent is really important. Whether it's crazy glue, super glue, gorilla glue, flex seal, what, whatever it is you're trying to use, having the right bonding agent is super important. And for the body of Christ, the best bonding agent that God has designed for us is love. In Ephesians 4.16, it says, From him, talking about Jesus, the whole body fitted and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love through the work of each individual part. So it's not just that because God loves us, we can be bound together. It's not just because of his great love that now the body fits together and supports each other and operates well, but it's actually the love through the work of each, of each individual part. So it's you and I playing our part of whatever part of the body God has created us to be, doing the part of building each other up in love through our works. And, and that's going to be one of the recurring themes this morning, is the love partnered with works. I think it's so important to tell people that you love them. Um, I was really surprised moving here from, from a different area and a different church culture to a church that said, I love you so much and so frequently. And, and if you came from an environment like I did, that might have been a little bit unnerving or a little bit like uncomfortable that like, man, all these people just love all the time. And that's, and it's not that my other, my other background or my other culture didn't love. It just, it wasn't so 
wasn't so available. It wasn't so always so spoken. But like every time I hang up a phone call with, with someone on staff, it always ends with I love you. And, um, and in other work environments, that would be really strange. Like that might even be an HR value, uh, violation. But here it's encouraged. And thank you. <laughs> and, so, and so it's beautiful to, to hear it. It's really important to say it, to tell the people in your life that you care for them. Um, man, I can't imagine getting to the end of my life and, and thinking, I wish I had said I love you less, right? Like, we're never going to arrive there. It'll always be the opposite. It'll always be, I wish I had told them more. I wish I had another opportunity to tell that person how much they, they mean to me and how much they love. But when I read about what Jesus describes as love, I, I understand that it does not stop there. That although that's a beautiful place to start and we should all be encouraged to, to communicate that well, the love that Jesus writes, the love that he I say he writes, the love that he speaks about, the love that the biblical authors write about, it seems to involve much more than just words. It it seems to involve actions. And so when Ephesians 4 says that building itself up in love through the work of each individual part, it's not this difficult labor or it's not this like, well, if if I do the thing that God created me to do, then other people will feel loved. There's some truth to that, but it's really, it's love expressing itself in action. That love becomes a verb and not just a noun. That love becomes an action that I take or a, uh, something that I do, an, an outworking, and not just a warm, fuzzy feeling, right? The warm fuzzies are wonderful, and I love when I feel them. Uh, I love when my kids give me big hugs, but I also love when there's a, a demonstration. I, I love to feel loved with a demonstration, with a, with a gift, um, with a... With, just all the different, you know, uh, we've sort of got the five love language things. You know, if you only ever just got words, that'd be fun for a while, but then it would be like, okay, but where's my other four? And I, and I feel that for the body of, of Christ. That sometimes on a Sunday morning, maybe we do well to give a Christian side hug or a handshake or a God bless you, brother. But, um, but we want to engage deeper than that. We want to be a family within these walls that loves each other very well with action and outside of these walls that loves others with action and that loves other parts of the body with action. Let's look at John chapter 13. In John chapter 13, Jesus is addressing his disciples and he says, So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. He says it's a a new commandment. So this is big. This isn't just a suggestion. This isn't just like, it would be nice if you could do it when you get around to it. This is a commandment. And he says, love each other. And he doesn't stop there, but he says, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. And so when we think back about how, how Jesus loved his disciples, he loved them with foot washing, He loved them with acts of service. He loved them uh, by feeding them. Uh, He loved them in very practical ways. He loved them by rescuing them. Um, Peter was drowning, and he pulls them up out of the water. He loves them by saving them. He loves them by uh, giving them the gift of the Holy Spirit. He loves them um, by praying for them and praying over them. And, And so again and again, we see these demonstrations, and then ultimately, he gives his life on the cross, But we see all these different demonstrations of a very real action that was fueled by love. It wasn't just that he told them, hey, disciples, I love you. And that was the end. And then he said, okay, now go and do likewise. But it really required some action. In John 15, so two chapters later, we see something really similar. John 15, 12, maybe just a page turn for some of you. It says, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. So we see the sacrificial service, giving up of comforts or privileges, laying down position, all of these beginning, um, all of these giving shape and giving, uh, giving real tangibility to the love that we're supposed to have towards others. Now, when we read that, the no greater love than to lay down one's life, we know that that's a reference to Jesus laying down his life for us. But we can also interpret that in a few ways. Not all of us will be called to die for someone, but sometimes laying down our life looks like um, giving up preference, 
giving up position, giving up comfortability. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can love someone that involves you laying down your life without dying. There's a lot of different ways that you can give of yourself um, without paying it the ultimate sacrifice. And I believe God calls us to be willing to do one and to constantly do the other, if that makes sense. Let's look at John chapter 3, verse 16. It's a lot of John passages. Later on, we're going to look at 1 John. Uh, and so there's a lot in here that he talks about with love. But John chapter 3, verse 16 says this. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. It's, it's very familiar, but in its familiarity, sometimes we can miss the fact that God links his love to the gift of his Son. That, that his love didn't just stop with, well, I made a pretty great world, and have you seen those sunsets lately? Like, you know, he, he didn't stop there. He gave, and he gave his most prized possession. He gave the thing that cost him the most. For God so loved the world that he gave. And so if we're going to love like God loves, we're going to begin to give. That is part of our action we're going to give of our time, of our energy, of our resources, we're going, to give, um, we're going to give a helping hand. We're, we're going to give a hug. We're going to give, and we're going to give and give and give until we become people of generosity that is fueled by love. So let's jump to 1 John. You were in the Gospel of John, now towards the end of the book, 1 John. And in, and in chapters 3 and 4, we see this kind of uh, beautiful progression that the author lays out that walks us through uh, through love from, from it being a commandment to it being fulfilled in, in action. Let's, let's take a look. I'm going to skip around a little bit, so, so follow along, class. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. It says, This is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Very simply. He boils it down to, to its, its core essence. This is the message from the beginning. Love one another. And then in verse 14, he says, If we love our brothers and sisters who are believers it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. So that's interesting. So now not only are we commanded to love, and we know that love should have action and love requires that, but not only that, but when we love with action, then it proves that we have passed from death to life. It becomes a proof of our salvation, that a life change now will be evident with works of love. Jumping down to verse 16 in chapter 3, it says, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth, so we will be confident when we stand before God. Wow. So we know what real love is, that's what he says in 16, and we recognize it because Jesus gave up his life. So he's linking that what real love is involves a giving. And then he ties it not just to, to giving up our lives in this sort of like... Um, imaginative or hypothetical way, but then he gets really practical in 17. He says, if someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? That's a, that's a hard heart check for me. When I read the Bible, it's so easy for me to see myself as the, the hero in the story or to see myself as like the person who's doing well to see myself as like, I'm, I'm David conquering Goliath. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Joshua marching around Jericho. I am, you know, the disciples when they're operating in faith, not in fear. I am, and to see myself in, in these good things. But there's, there's a humility that we should approach the word of God with. That we shouldn't just assume that we are doing well, if we're not. And many of us are doing well. This is an encouragement, not just a condemnation. You guys are, you know, I want to encourage you guys. You're loving well. But, um, 
But when he, when he talks about if someone has enough money to live well and see our brothers and sisters, I have this tendency to think, well, because there are richer people than me, I must not be living well. But when we remind ourselves that like 90% of the world sees us as living well, and we see the 1% living better, and we think, oh, okay, then I must be the one who needs help. It, perspective is a funny thing. So he says, if we don't do this, how can God's love be in that person? Verse 18, dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let's show the truth by our actions. Let's put our money where our mouth is. And if we're going to be people of love, and if we're going to follow the commandment of Jesus to love others, let's put some real action to it. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth, so we will be confident when we stand before God. And then skipping down a little bit farther, chapter 4, verse 7. It says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. So we're hearing that that for a, a second time now. This is real love, verse 10. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. When I, when I read that, what I interpret that is real love is not just loving people who deserve it, loving people who, even before they deserve it, loving people who didn't deserve it. When God sent Jesus for me, I did not deserve it. I had done nothing to earn it, and nor could I ever earn it. And so when we think about loving people, and loving them with actions, it's not just the ones who've earned it or deserved it. Real love is going to be giving it to people who have done nothing to earn it and who have done nothing to deserve it. He continues in verse 11, Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. And a lot of other translations will imply like this obligation, not just like, well, you should do it, but like you are obligated to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. So as we love each other, God begins to manifest in us. That's how I interpret that. If we love each other, God lives in us. We're obligated to love. So that's the foundation that I'm laying. Now I want to look at a few other texts, and I want to I want to extract some different lessons from them. And the beautiful thing about the Word of God is no matter how many times you've seen a passage, you can always pull more out of it. It's like a, it's a, like a never-ending gold mine where every time you go in, you come out with more than you went in with, and you always see it a little differently, and, and, and the Holy Spirit can, can bring a spirit of revelation about a thing that you've never seen until, until today. And so we're going to look at these with fresh eyes, and, and we're going to ask the Lord to illuminate our heart. Let's start in James chapter 2. We're looking at love and action, using those kind of synonymously this morning, and, and even giving, that if we're going to give our lives, if we're going to give our time, if we're going to give our energy, if we're going to give to people in need, um, we're going to see that as proof of our salvation. First John was, was alluding to that, where it says, you know, um, Anyone who does not love does not know God, and that this is why we can stand confidently before him. But now let's look at some other texts that, that further that thought. James chapter 2, verse 14. James 2, 14. It says, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, Goodbye, have a good day. Stay warm, eat well, but you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, those are harsh words, but he's linking our practical giving of food and clothing to salvation because it's the fruit of our faith that because I believe everything that God says— I believe even the parts where he says that my love needs to produce actions and that my love for him produces obedience. And so when I put all that equation together, I cannot have salvation without the fruit of salvation, which is producing good works, even practical things like food and clothing. 
Like that doesn't feel very spiritual. Like if you had just asked Andrew, how would you design the Christian system? It would look a little differently. I would think that the, the mark of spiritual maturity would be spiritual things. But the, the authors of the Bible had greater wisdom and they said, no, it's actually in the, in the beautifully simple things. It's in the practical things. It's in a warm meal and a hot coat, maybe a warm coat and a hot meal. It's in the giving of these little things that actually shows the mark of our maturity. It's not in how long you can pray or how many big theological words you can use or how many worship songs you know. It's, it's in this. Like when the rubber hits the road, like are you really willing to, to maybe even be a little uncomfortable if it means loving others well? That becomes a mark of maturity. Faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. Let's look at Luke 3, 7. I know I've got you guys jumping around a lot. Luke chapter 3, verse 7. This is John the Baptist. He's preaching. This is before Jesus has begun his public ministry. And, and John is a really unique uh, moment and figure in the Bible because he's one of these transitional figures that moves us from one covenant to another. Uh, he's a transitional figure where he's still operating under old covenant but with a new covenant paradigm and so he's beginning to usher in new covenant teachings, uh, New Testament ideas and philosophies, and he's doing it as a, as a forerunner. So John the Baptist, this is Luke chapter 3, verse 7. It says, When the crowds came to John for baptism, he said, You brood of snakes, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Which would be a strange way if you guys came in this morning and you're like, Oh, we're coming to church. And that was like my opening line to my sermon. You brood of snakes. So, <laughs> if you think my messages are hard, like, <laughs> anyways, he continues. He says, prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. So he's, he's wanting to see a demonstration. It's not just enough to say, well, my heart has changed. He says, no, 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 prove it by the way you're living that you're really repenting and turning to God. He says, don't just say to each other, we're safe for we're descendants of Abraham that means nothing, for I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now, the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. Verse 10, the crowds asked, what should we do? And John replied, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. So he's saying, produce fruit that is consistent in keeping with a repentant heart. Prove that you've turned to God. And they said, what should we do? And he said, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. That's a, that's a curveball for me. Because again, I, I would have expected you need to go to temple more often. You need to pray more often. Like you need to make sure that like what you're listening to is edifying. I would have thought it would have been very spiritual things. And John says the fruit of repentance is very practically, it's sharing what you have with those people who don't have. So the crowds asked him. Then in verse 12, even corrupt tax collector, collectors came to be baptized and asked, teacher, what should we do? And he replied, collect no more taxes than the government requires. The tax men back then didn't have TurboTax to like validate, so he would just show up and say, this is how much you owe, and people were like, I guess he's the tax guy. And they were lying, and they were, they were padding, you know, so if you only owed 50 bucks, and they were like, oh, you owe 75, they'd keep the 25 and, and give 50 to the Romans. And, uh, and so they were stealing from all the people. And so John's, and, and this was understood, but no one really had, like, power to fight it. And so John's response to them is collect no more taxes than the government requires. He says, stop stealing. His response to them, what is the fruit of repentance? It's dealing with money. Verse 14, what should we do, asked some soldiers. John replied, don't extort money or make false accusations and be content with your pay. So in all three groups, the crowds, the tax collectors, and the soldiers, his, his litmus test for have I really shown repentance in my heart, have I really turned to God, all three of them had to do with money and finances. All three of them had to do with giving. It's interesting. In Luke 19, we see something a little bit similar. Luke 19, verse 1, 
uh, begins to tell us a story about Zacchaeus. Uh, the story about Zacchaeus is pretty short, short so I'm just going to read it so you can hear it kind of in its context and entirety. Luke chapter 19, verse 1. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. Remember how I talked about these tax collectors are stealing, and, um, and they're, not, they're not very popular <laughs> for that reason. He had become very rich. Verse 3, he tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass along that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He, talking about Jesus, has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Verse 8, Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. And check out Jesus' response. Verse 9, it says, Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. Wow. He didn't pray the sinner's prayer. He didn't, like, come up with this, like, doctrinal credo and say, like, oh, like, Jesus, you're the son of the... He doesn't say any of that. All he says is, I'm going to give to the poor and I'm going to pay back the people have done. He makes a money decision, a financial decision, and Jesus says, salvation. You've been saved today. You've been brought back into the family of God. That's powerful. That's interesting. I believe... Both of these examples, with John talking about finances, Jesus doing it with Zacchaeus, talking about finances linked with, linked with um, salvation, lived, linked with a heart change, a heart of repentance, I believe it's because it's a heart matter, not a wallet matter. This is a heart matter, not a wallet matter. In Luke 16, verse 13, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for you will either hate one and love the other, you will be devoted to one and despise the other. And then, in case there's any ambiguity, he says you cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Verse 14, this is the one that we don't always quote in context. It says, the Pharisees who dearly loved their money heard all this and scoffed at him. Oh, man. Have we ever been in a position where Jesus has asked for something in our finances and because we've dearly loved our money, we heard it and we scoffed at him. That's dangerous. Then he said to them, you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. What this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. It's a heart issue. It's not about the finances. God doesn't need our money. God doesn't need anything. He's self-sufficient. And so by definition, he has everything he needs and does not need anything. And that's a good place to start because when we understand he's not asking for us to give because he needs, we're not having to support him. He's not, you know, an, an elderly parent that's run through their retirement that now we're having to, like, financially take care of. That's not God. God is, um, he has so much and has no need. And his, his asking and requiring us to give is only for our benefit not for his. It is only for our benefit because of how closely money gets attached to our hearts. And so if we're going to love, which is, is like idealized in the heart, like if there was a body part that, that represented love, it would be the heart. But the thing that competes for our heart so fiercely is finances. Of course God is going to link money and love together. That our love is going to be demonstrated by our giving. At Christmas time, you buy gifts for the people you love. You give those to them, not begrudging, not like, ugh, can't believe I have to buy this person this gift. <laughs> if you've got children, you love it. You love seeing how they, they beam with joy on Christmas morning. When it's someone's birthday and you've seen, like, the perfect gift and you know, like, oh, this is going to make their year, like, you buy it with joy, even if it is costly. And when you give it, they receive it with joy, especially when it's costly. Not necessarily um, valuable, you know, like 
Like sometimes rich people give other rich people expensive gifts, and, and that's nice. But when someone of, of meager means gives something that costs them very much, that is incredibly precious. And so it's a heart matter. It's not a wallet matter. And this is one of the passages I, w- I want to spend a little bit of time on. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. This is the encounter that Jesus has with the rich man. It says this, Mark 10, 17. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In, in the parallel accounts of this, Matthew 19 and Luke 18, it, dis, it describes this this young man, as a rich young ruler. So he's of of means, and he has lots of wealth and property possessions. But he runs up to Jesus, kneels down, and asks him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. Which for a long time, I looked at that, and I was like, that's a weird thing to say, because I think Jesus definitely is good, and also is God. So why would he say that? And I was reminded recently that it was common for rabbis in that time, and although we don't necessarily think of Jesus as a rabbi often because we're not Jewish and we're not in that context, um, for him, he was functioning in a lot of ways like a rabbi. He had disciples that followed him, and there's even some times where um, I think one of the Marys calls him Rabboni, and that's like gets translated as rabbi. And, and so he was functioning like a teacher, like a rabbi. And it was common for rabbis and teachers in that day to do a lot of uh, questioning, that they wouldn't just tell a student or a disciple something. They would ask some questions to help them arrive at a certain conclusion, uh, very sort of Socratic. And so he says, why do you call me good? Jesus asked, only God is truly good. Now we, in hindsight, totally understand that Jesus is good and is God, But in that moment, the rich man understood enough to know that Jesus had authority on this subject. That's why he ran to him to ask him. Uh, He revered him. That's why he knelt down. But he didn't quite yet put him in the position of God. And so what Jesus is doing with this sort of wordplay is questioning him to say, if you think I'm good and you're kneeling before me, might you think that I'm God? Like, could you treat my words with the same authority as God? I have authority, like, I'm speaking with authority in regards to eternal life. So clearly, like, you think I'm close. Let's ask some questions to see if I can get you 100% there. So I believe that's what he's doing with these questionings. Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments, which makes me think of, like, in Exodus, the Ten Commandments. He says the Ten Commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone and honor your father and your mother. So it's six commandments that he quotes. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, verse 21, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad for he had many possessions. I've already said it's a heart matter, not a wallet matter. We see Jesus require a lot of this rich young ruler, but there was lots of other people uh, around Jesus that followed Jesus and even helped uh, fund and bankroll his ministry that he didn't ask a similar thing of, that he didn't tell them also, oh, go and sell everything, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. He was content to let them follow and keep their wealth. And the reason I think it's different for this has to do with the way he lays out the commandments. Jesus says, you know the commandments in verse 19, and then he lists off six of them. But the two that he doesn't list off is keep God first in your life and don't have any idols. I believe the young man in his self-assessment said, I'm doing all the right things. And he runs up to Jesus because he wants to, be, wants to be validated that he will inherit eternal life. He's working hard to keep a lot of the rules, but he's lost sight of the first and second commandment. No other gods before me, no idols. And so Jesus says, you know the commands, 
And he gives him several of them. And he says, yes, I've kept all those. And then what he does next is he doesn't just say, but you failed. Jesus isn't always harsh like that. He doesn't just tell him where he's failed. Instead, he asks him a question to expose what's already in his heart. That's why we see this lead up about only God is truly good and why do you call me good? That's important because if we can see Jesus as God and then God can ask for our money, if our response is no, it's because either we've put something else in front of God or we've made an idol out of, it, out of our money or both. And so this rich young ruler goes away sad, not just because Jesus asked a difficult thing, although it was very difficult for him, but because he also exposed in his life where he wasn't following all the commandments. He was following several of them, and that's good, but he was missing eternal life because he was, he was valuing his finances greater than valuing God. He was holding tighter in his heart onto his wealth and his position than he was onto eternal life and eternal position. And so that cautioned me this week. As I was reading through this and preparing these notes, I was nervous. I was like, Lord, where am I like this rich young ruler? Where have I only seen where I'm doing well? Yeah, I've kept all these commandments. I've kept all the commandments since I was a youth. But I'm missing certain ones. And Lord, in your kindness, would you discipline me because you love me? And would you ask me the question that would expose where in my heart I'm not trusting you? I'm not giving well. I'm not loving others well enough. Uh, I'm holding back or I'm putting something in a position higher than you. It reminds me of another passage in Luke 12. And as we read it, I'll invite the worship team to come back up. In Luke 12, verse 13, it says, Then someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. And that verse um, jars me a little bit because here you have someone crying out for justice and Jesus' response is, Watch out for greed. And in the same way where you have, you have the, the rich young ruler who's who's being challenged with, with this heart condition, that it wasn't just about his wealth, it was about where the wealth sat in competition against God. I, I, feel this, I feel this caution from Luke 12 that there are times where greed, idolatry, the spirit of mammon, they all have a way of disguising themselves as something better than they are. That being a good provider, wanting justice, supplying basic needs to our family, having a good work ethic. All of those things are really good, but they can also be a mask to hide a, an area of our heart that we haven't fully surrendered to God. When we sing the vow and we even repeated it, with all that I have and with all that I am, I will love you. There might be areas of our heart that we've held back and, and we've given it a good name. And like the rich young ruler, we've said, no, 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 I'm following all the commands. But would we allow ourselves this morning to come before God and just say, God, if there's anything, search my heart, know me. If there's anything in me that is offensive, if there's anything in me that is keeping me from eternal life, that's keeping me from how John the Baptist describes it, it's showing the fruit of repentance, or how James responds about it, the, the actions that are required to prove my faith, all of these linkings that we see between our heart position and our finances, Lord, would you come in and examine our hearts? Would you come in and examine us to begin to reveal those places where we've held back? And if we're called to be a people who love, and love is required to have action, and that action often looks like giving, not necessarily finances, maybe you give your time, maybe you give your energy, maybe you give up a room in your house, maybe you give up uh, a convenience, maybe you give up um, your entitlements, maybe you give up, there's so many ways you could give. It's, it's not just about money, 
but we see it come back to money several times. If we're called to be a people that give, but we are finding it hard to give, let's bring that before the Lord this morning. I want to close this morning with communion. We've got the elements at the front here, and we're going to do this sort of slowly. I don't want to rush through it, but it's really... I find in my life it makes it so much easier to be generous when I'm reminded of how generous God's been to me. In the act of taking communion, it cuts deep into my heart to to recognize Jesus' ultimate sacrifice, his demonstration of love for me, and then it it makes me feel like uh, that parable of the unforgiving debtor He gets forgiven this huge debt, and then he goes out immediately that afternoon and shakes down someone who owes him only a tiny bit. I begin to see myself in that way when I take communion, and then I tell God, but I'm not going to give to these other people. (laughs) When I take communion and say, no, but I'm not going to do that. And it it cuts me, and so I, I, I I don't mean this in a way that's supposed to, like, manipulate you into feeling something, but if you're in a position where you say, God, I want you to, to expose the things in my heart, communion's going to do it. And, and, and I would even caution you, don't come up and take communion if you are unwilling to be obedient, because the Lord is going to speak clearly to you, and then you'll be required to do what he says. And it would be better for you to cut out early and say, no, I didn't hear that, <laughs> than to hear it and say, I will be disobedient to that. As we prepare our hearts for that, let me share one more passage with you. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Jesus is nearing the end of his public ministry, and he's preparing his disciples for what's going to happen long term. Not just this week, this month, but the end of the age. And he says, Matthew 25, 31, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations, all the peoples will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. And then Jesus shifts, and he stops the simile language, And he says, then the king, no longer talking about shepherds and and animals. He says, then the king will say to those people on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. How many people want to hear that? The end of the age, Jesus on a glorious throne, come inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Verse 35 is the kicker. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. We have an incredible opportunity to minister not just to the heart of the Lord, but to the body of the Lord. But it looks like ordinary people. And it can be confusing on the surface. Well, how does my gift to him mean anything to God? I don't know, but he says it does. He seems to care a lot about it because... He even uses it as a sort of uh, sorting mechanism. Okay, did you give? No? All right, over here on the left. Did you give? Yes? Cold water? Warm meal? Some coats? Great. Okay, over here on the right. And he sorts it. The passage continues. It says, Then the king will turn to those on his left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. And then they will reply, confused, 
Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. If you take this at face value, this sort of rocks your doctrine a little bit. He doesn't separate them on, did you acknowledge me as Christ? He doesn't separate them on, did you pray a sinner's prayer? He separates them on, did you love with action people who couldn't pay you back with anything? Did you love with action people who didn't have uh, anything they could give you in return? Did you love with action in a way that was unseen and unnoticed and, and, uh, and not braggadocious or, or, or prideful? He uses that as his litmus test. And he does it because he relates so deeply with his body. We see this in Acts 9. Saul is persecuting believers. He's imprisoning Christians. And he's persecuting the church. And, and Jesus shows up in a bright light and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He doesn't say, why are you persecuting my church? He doesn't say, why are you persecuting Christians? He says, why are you persecuting me? Jesus relates deeply. He identifies deeply with the people in his body. And we have an opportunity to love him and give gifts to him. And if he were to walk through those doors, I know all of us would do it. But when a stranger walks through the doors, we don't greet them with the same hospitality. We don't honor them with the same amount. When we pass someone who's having a difficult time, we aren't moved with the same level of honor or love or compassion. And, and this, is, this is a conviction to me that I still have lots of areas to grow, but I'm encouraged to be running with such a faithful family. We have, we have families in our congregation that have signed up to say we will foster care not because it's fun or convenient, but because we will love those who have been cast off. We will love those who can't take care of themselves. We have families who have opened up basements and homes and empty rooms uh, to, to people who are either in between shelter or people who have rough home lives, young people who can't quite make it on their own yet, but can't stay in their house. It's like, okay, hey, come. You can stay with us for a while. And so I'm so encouraged to be running with people who, who serve at our food bank or, or donate clothes to the blessing room. We have so many areas where you guys are doing this well. But I want to encourage you in, in two ways. There's still more we can do. And there is a, an eternal reward for all that you are doing. So if you're giving well, praise God. You will receive a reward. Do not lose, uh, what is it, um, don't get tired of doing good things. Continue to do the good works. And for those of you who have not engaged in this way because you didn't understand its value, you didn't realize how much it meant to Jesus, I want to encourage you this morning, it means a lot to Jesus. It means a lot to Jesus. What you do with your time and your talents and your treasures and your resources, what you do with those things matters a lot because it's an overflow of your heart. Again, God doesn't need us to give because he needs it. He needs us to give for us, for our benefit, to free our hearts up from, from greed and from idolatry and to continue to elevate Christ to the highest position in our hearts. All right. Would you stand? I'm going to pray for you. And then I'm going to give you an opportunity to come and receive communion. Remind ourselves of, of the ultimate, ultimate gift that God has given to us, his son, sonship that we have now uh, status as heirs not just servants it would have been enough if he canceled our debts and then we had to serve him for the rest of our lives that would have been that would have been kind what he did is beyond words to bring us in as sons and daughters and give us the inheritance that was supposed to go to christ but his death made it possible for it to come to us jesus we thank you we thank you Father God, that it is in your nature to be generous. And as people called by your name, we should be generous as well. Father, we pray that your love would overflow within us, producing compassion and good works. Lord, that we wouldn't just love with words, but we would love with action, real love, that we would give of ourselves. Lord, we pray that we wouldn't hide behind the other things that we're doing well, Lord, we pray that we wouldn't um, misdiagnose our heart like the rich young ruler. 
Lord, we pray that we wouldn't get caught up in zeal like Saul and, and actually work against you. Father, we pray that we would elevate you to the highest position in our lives and that our hearts would be fully submitted to you and that from that overflow of submission and love, Lord, that we would become generous. Generous with our times, generous with our closets, generous with empty rooms, generous with finances, generous with, um, with caring for others and, and, and being hospitable and inviting them over or bringing a, 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 a warm coat or a hot meal or giving a word of encouragement or writing a letter to, to encourage someone. Lord, I pray that whatever it is, Lord, nothing goes too small. You recognize a, a glass of cold water. You, you recognize it all. And so, Father, would you motivate us to those good works? Let us be a people who are recognized by our incredible love, that they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. Lord, let us be known by your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on up as you feel led. Take communion. We might have a song. Do we have a song? We have a song. Jesus, I am yours. And Jesus, I am yours. Jesus, I Jesus, I am This is my prayer, it's my solemn vow With all that I have, with all that I am I will love you I will love you With all of my heart, my soul, and my mind, I pour out an offering of worship and cry, I will love you. I will love you. This is my prayer, it's my solemn vow, with all that I am. With all that I have, I will love you. I will love you. With all of my heart, my soul, and my mind, I pour out an offering of worship and cry, I will love you. I will love you. I will love you. I will love you. And Jesus, I am yours. And for I want nothing more than to be with you, Jesus, I am yours, and forever I want nothing more than to be with you. by your blood it's only cause you loved us it's only by your blood 
It's only cause you loved us It's only by your blood It's only cause you loved us It's only by your blood It's only cause you loved us It's only by your blood it's only cause you loved us It's only by your blood It's only cause you loved us And Jesus, I am yours And forever I want And to be with you, Jesus, I am yours, and forever I want nothing more than to be with you. Oh, to be with you. give you everything you can have it all I give you everything you can have it all I give you everything you can have it all I give you you can have it all I give you everything You can have it all I give you everything You can have it all I give you everything you can have it all I give you everything You can have it all I give you everything You can have it all I give you everything You can have it all I give you everything You can have it all I give you You can have it We're just doing a soft close, so you are welcome to leave. But I'll tell you what, if you just stand up, we're, I just want to read this scripture over us as we leave this place. Comes out of Second Peter. It says this. 
the prefaces of it, the first few verses talk about this divine power that He has given us to live a life of godliness through the knowledge of Christ as He calls us by His own glory and His goodness. Those are the good works. Those are the things that He calls us to. And then He says this. He says, through these He has given us His very great and His precious promises so that through those promises that we are able to actually participate in the divine nature. This is the actions that He has for us. And in so doing, escape from the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. And then He gives us the how. And this just connects right with what Andrew spoke of today. And it's this progression and what he says. He goes, so for this rare, very reason, here's the parts. I'm just going to pray this. Lord, I, I ask that as you gave us these very progressive, these pieces that to step into, you say that it starts with our faith. You're the author, Jesus, of our faith, and it begins with you, Jesus. And then it says, from that place, make every effort to add to the faith goodness. These are the good things that we do. And then as we add to the goodness, what happens is there's a knowledge. The very knowledge of God is revealed in a deeper way. We begin to get a greater understanding. And then from that place of, of knowledge, there's actually a self-control, which is a fruit of the Spirit that, that says, no, I'm not going to live those ways. I'm not going to live over here in, in these things, but I'm going to live I'm going to live under this place of self-control in the things that God has for me to do. And then when we begin to take hold of that self-control, it allows us to step into a perseverance an enduring faith. It takes us beyond the initial faith into an enduring, persevering faith. And, and then from that persevering faith, so now as we've, we've gone through this progression of goodness into knowledge, knowledge then giving us this self-control, self-control then taking us into this place of persevering faith, and persevering faith actually sets us in a place of godliness. And, and, and this, Lord, I thank you that this is the desire of your heart, that it's this progression of you're calling us into these things. You're calling us into a, a, a life of godliness that comes from your divine power that gives us the life of godliness. And then as we live this life of godliness, it, it allows us to then step into a brotherly kindness for others. So it's not, it, it isn't this place where we just go and say, well, we're just going to hand out money. We're going to hand out these things. There's this progression of, no, we're actually doing the very will of God. It's a knowledge of Him. It's an understanding that, that, that sets us apart from the world in that place of, uh, of self-control that allows us to persevere into a life of godliness that then we can operate in brotherly kindness. And then from that place of brotherly kindness, then we begin to possess and walk and live in His love. A love that we cannot do in and of ourselves. We don't have the ability to love the way Christ loved without the power of the Holy Spirit operating in and through us and taking us through this progression into this place where we can love as Christ loved us. And then it says, and if you possess these qualities in an increasing measure, going back, it says that we would make every effort to do these things. If we, in, if we increase in our measure of these things, it will keep us from being ineffective in this world and unproductive in this world. And the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ in what He has, His plans, His purposes for each one of us. But if we don't do them, if we just say, well, no, we're just going to live our own life, He says, then, then we're, we're nearsighted, we're blind. 
And we've actually forgotten that Jesus has cleansed us from our past sins. Lord, may we not forget and be blind from those things. So therefore, brothers, sisters, may we be all the more eager, strengthen us right now for the calling and the election. Make it sure in our lives. Make it certain in our lives. For if we do the things that you call us to do, if we do the action of love, it says that we will never fail. But we will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is what we desire. Strengthen us for the days ahead. Help us to, to, by your spirit, I love the fact that it starts with, you give us the divine power for life and godliness, to step in, to take every effort to do the things you call us to do. Lord, I pray for that. I pray for the strength of the Holy Spirit, that it is not by our power, it's not by our might, it is by the move of the Spirit that we would align with the Spirit and we would move by the Spirit as children of God. It begins with faith, and it ends with love. I bless every person in this place. I thank you, Lord, for what you've called us to. May we be a people that love well. In Jesus' name, amen.